The other thing I want to mention is that uh, if you're not speaking, please mute your phone, uh, or mute your mic, uh, so that you don't interfere with the uh, presentations. And the second, if when you do call, when you do speak and you want to be heard, uh, please, when you unmute, after you unmute, please uh, announce who you are and where you come from so that we can all get a nice idea of, of the people that are joining us. I see Michael Salter down there. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. Another Canadian who snuck in across the border. All right. John, where do you want me to start in the uh, in the pictures? Do you want me to start with that that first? Uh, yeah, I, I want to get. You know, I'll tell you when to get. I'll say A. Is that okay? Does that work? Or well, we'll see. You know, I will try to see if it will work, but I'm not sure that it's going to. Okay. Well, anyway, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks, Michael or uh, um, Rick, for let, inviting me in, and thanks everybody for taking the time to actually dial in here. We all need one more Zoom call. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, I mean, darn, look at that. Look at that. Um, I, I hope that's your uh, logo. It is. It is. Thank you so much. Um, anyway, it, 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 um, he asked me to do this and he says, we got any pictures. I'm like, well, I'd rather have pictures than me. So this will probably work out a little bit better. Um, I'm in Chicago. I live, I live in a suburb, uh, just west of O'Hare airport and, uh, lived in Chicago all my life. I'm, I'm running down. I'm running down Rick's script, which is pretty comprehensive. Um, you know, John. I tell everybody this is all informal. There's no script, and then you, you know, you're the second well, guest. It's not a script as much as it's make sure you cover these points stuff. So, <laughs> I, um, I guess my first car was a TR3. My my uh, uh, my first rides as a kid. We didn't own a car when I was growing up. I lived in the city, so my dad would borrow an MGA from a friend of his, and he'd take us out on drives on Lakeshore Drive, which was right on the right on the lake there. And, you know, I always I got this feel as like when I when I get older, I'm going to have one of these. And so my first car was a clapped out TR3. It didn't la it, it lasted. I lasted longer than it did. Um, but I've had, you know, different different cars, but that was my first car. And I've always wanted to, you know, kind of, you know, migrate back to that. Um, I got in. I got involved back with Healy's because at, at some point I had a real job and I had to have a real car that would get me to work on Monday morning. So I ended up with uh, some BMWs and a, and a, and a, um, a few Porsches and, and they were a little bit more reliable than some of the stuff I had earlier. I had an MGB earlier, but I always had a second car. So as it turns out, you know, as it turns out, um, you know, I, I, Healy was in my future, but as a, as a second car. So the first Healy I bought, um, I, I was trying to figure out what kind of car I wanted to have, but I needed something with highway potential, you know? So, you know, as a second car, if you couldn't take it on the highway. And nowadays, you know, as you guys have all probably noticed and guys and girls here, um, you know, <laughs> 75 miles an hour, you're just working the crap out of these cars. And so, you, you know, if you could, Try to do that in Austin, in a Sprite or an MGB or even a TR6. You're okay up to about 65, but if you kind of continue on, you've got quite a quite a job ahead of you. So, um, we, uh, I decided I I, I try I try a Healy. I, I bought a BJ I bought a BJ7. Um, <clears throat> see here, where in God's name am I here? Um, See, I got Rick. You sent me. You've got. I've got a screen popped up here. Yeah. Is are these? Um, these are which? I'm trying to figure out how they, how this all worked. Is this what you want to show? No. What I wanted to show was some of my cars. Um, uh, these, are, these are the Healy. So this would be like A. Which Healy do you? I didn't get an A. I got a D and an F. Oh, then you didn't get all of them. Oh my God, you got more? Yeah, believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not, I won't. I won't crush you with them. Um, my the first one I had was a '63 BJ7. Um, was a '63 BJ7, and I've had I've 
I think he had five of them. And those are the whole cars, you know, not just the, the, the titles and the parts cars I bought through the business. Um, I, um, I'm trying to think here. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that maybe you ended up with some of the, some of the cars. Um, you know what you can do, John, if you can, if you can go into, if you can pull up those pictures, you should be able to screen share from your computer. Oh, okay. Let me try to do that. Sure. It sounds so easy. Doesn't it? Yeah, we, 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 you know, us old fogies, we all sit around trying to figure out how to do this. And that'd be fine. So nobody, nobody feels bad that they can't, you know, figure it out. You disabled attendee screen sharing. Yeah, I will, I will enable it as soon as I can cool. do this. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it's not going to be as smooth as, as the Tonight Show. I spent, a, I spent all afternoon trying to get just the right photos for you, and now they're somewhere out there. Well, we'll figure it out somehow. Just stand by, everyone. So while you're, while you're we're waiting here to excite the heck out of everyone, did you... Uh, Grew up in the Chicago area? I did. I did. I, I um, grew up in Chicago. We moved out to Park Ridge, Illinois for like high school, which is right, right. It's near the airport, if any of you know the Chicagoland area. Um, but I, I really haven't left. I've been pretty much here most of my life. I've, I've, I've had jobs that, where I've traveled around the country and the world, but I've never, if you can't get there out of O'Hare, you can't get there. It's been always kind of my, my motto. Although, I've worked for companies in up in up in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. I worked for a company in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I've I've spent time in the East Coast or a fair amount of time. There. Can you uh, see this one, John? I'm sorry. Can you see this picture? I'm seeing all your stuff still. Ah, uh, stand by. We're gonna Jesus. Okay. Okay, you just disabled host screen yep. sharing. Okay. All right, let's go. We, we, we're getting there. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm impressed that you guys are even trying this. To me, screen sharing is like when I hand copper tone to my daughter. <laughs> or I, you know, I'm not. How's that working yet? We, you should be able to share now. Okay, hold on. Screen share. Desktop. Okay. This will help. Okay, let me see if I can. I see John Heffern is is uh, called in too. Are you in, are you in Phoenix, John? Okay, there's me, and then. Oh. Are we anywhere yet? Well, we see. Uh, yeah, we see a BJ seven, seven a red one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now we can now I can I can kind of pick it up from here. Um, this is uh, this is the first car I had. Uh, I had it. I bought it in '95. I just recently sold it. Apparently, you can sell these. I didn't know that. Um, mm. I actually sold it to a, a Healy Club member here in Chicago, and um, you know, it's 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 obviously a pretty it's a pretty car. He had a car that he'd owned for 27 years, and and. I, he got a he got a good deal on it. I'm I'm happy that the car went to somebody who's going to continue to use it. Um, Do you mind telling us what you uh, spent for what you got for that? Forty five. Okay. You know, mechanically it was perfect because um, it's my car. Obviously, um, the, the the back of the car was a little bit faded. That's the that's the part that was like out in the sun. Um, you know, when when the garage door was open over the years. You know, over twenty years and a. The, the lacquer paint was starting to craze a little bit, but other than that, you know, the car is really pretty. The interior is fresh, um, fresh engine, fresh trans, basically. Um, it, it's a nice car. I was going to keep it, but, uh, you know, I, I keep coming up on all these great deals. So um, here was my second Healy. It was a Bug Eye Sprite that I still own, and I, I vintage raced it. Um, and then I ran out of space. Here's another BJ7 race car I'm building now. Everybody can see this, right? Yes. yes. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. I just want to make sure. Um, this is a BJ7 race car that, that Mark Baker and I were putting together uh, before he passed away. This was this car, and then I had another twin to this that we were working on. Um, this one's still under construction. The engine's done. The body's, uh, the body's here. It's in about 800. Um, actually, it's actually in 600. It's just about ready to go. Um, it was funny. I bought one of those early, early uh, Dennis Welsh, um, sh you know, uh, breakaway steering columns and boxes years ago. And we finally went in and installed when you turn the wheels to the right, you turn the steering wheel to the right, the wheels go to the, <laughs> go to the left. I'm like, Jesus Christ, it's going to be hard to learn how to drive this car. Um, it's our right-hand drive set up. Yeah, it is. I, you know, we, <laughs> we put it in. I'm like, are you kidding me? It had, just, it had been sitting in the shelf for a long time. Um, it looks like you're going to Weber access panel here. Is that right? it's, yeah. It's, it'll have triple Webers on it. And it, it's, it's, It'll be, you know, it's, it's going to have a hard top. As you can see, it's, it also has a, a net, you know, a net um, um, uh, uh, a hookup on it, on the, on the roll bar on that side. The car, the car will be ready to go. It's just, I've got so many other priorities. My stuff tends to be one of the last things that gets done. Well, racing is a good investment anyway. So, you know, that's a good yeah, idea. I know. I, know. I, I was talking to somebody today who was, complaining that a race entry was a hundred dollars more than it was the year before i just started laughing i said if, if you if, if you if you're not willing to go to the track with like three one hundred dollar bills and just burn them okay just burn them with a lighter you probably shouldn't be racing you know mm -hmm. I think it's a smart thing to do but if, if that if that if you find that to be horrible it's that's a problem um hey gents i'm gonna have to depart i've got something i have to take care of apparently something i said david I'm sorry, man. Uh, uh, it was from the very beginning, John, but you know, hey. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, man. Take care. Bye-bye. And, John, are you going to run that car with wire wheels? No, I'm probably just going to use the, the the solids, like on this car here, Peter. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll use the splines. Um, I'm not going to put the studs on it. it. You can. I just don't think it's going to be that big, it's that big a deal. Um these seem to work out okay, and they'll accept the speed, the Hoosier Speedsters, which is probably what I'll run on the car, because they seem they seem to be about the best tire for that application, and they're legal everywhere. Um, where, do you, where do you race mostly, John? I, I, uh, Chicago Land area has actually got a lot of places. It's Blackhawk Farms, which has been around for, geez, fifty plus years. Road America, uh, Audubon Country Club has actually become a pretty good track. Gingerman Raceway and. Um, uh, Gingerman Raceway is in um, um, South Haven, Michigan. And then in Groton, Michigan is Groton International Raceway, which is the craziest track on the planet. And uh, I, I finally drove it last year and it was a lot of fun. So we've got a lot of choices. Um, you know, it's really a timing issue. We had out of two or three times last year, trying to figure out how to make mass work. And I don't think we had any uh, super spreader events. So they'll probably let us do it again, at least starting in the new year. So you must race with uh, Severin Thompson and Suave. I do. I do. Um, That's too bad. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm. I'm. I cut. I cut my comment short, Rick. I didn't say anything. I'm kidding. No, they're both. They're both swell guys. They're both swell guys. We're, I'm, I'm actually pretty good friends with both of them. Um, here's my. Here's my BJ8. This one I bought from a customer. Um, he, he had another shop. Another shop had done the car up to a certain point and um he, he brought it to me to try to save it and we 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 painted the car in white and uh gave it back to him and he and his son were gonna rebuild it they were gonna finish it so i said okay so we we finished we did it we sent it to him it's, it took a lot of work to kind of get it squared away and it's a really it's a square car it's got a kill martin new fresh kill martin chassis on it um you know it's it's it was solid so he, his kid decided he wanted to go racing. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to rebuild an old Healy. So they changed, they changed course and called me and said, Hey, you know, anybody wants to buy one of these? And I said, I, you know, I don't know what you're going to get. And I made him an offer and he, he called me back a few minutes later and he said, you know, I'll take it. So he's got first right of, he's got right of first refusal on the car now. Um, you know, cause it turned out so nice. It's, it, it's, it's a really nice car. I, 
I did I did a few things to it that the purists hate. You know, it doesn't have wire wheels on it, and it's it's got a Toyota five speed in it because the trans was such junk that I just I didn't want to spend the money to upgrade it. And I wanted to try one of these things, and they're actually pretty nice. I know a lot of people hate them, but uh, I found it to be a good solution. Um, I, you know that. <laughs> The, 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 the transmissions and overdrives out on the, that are out there today, you know, if one is really junky, you know, it's going to cost, a, it costs a fortune to put them back in service. It really does. And, and to make them right, I know, um, you know, Mike Salter, you, you've had your, uh, you've had your share of those things. They're, they, these, these, this is a nice solution for that. Anyway, the car, you know, this car's got leather interior. They never came stock with leather interior. I did, I, I did a stock motor on it. Um, you know, I didn't do a ton of stuff, but it's a, it's a nice quiet car. It goes down the road. Well, um, I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Is this the one in your video? Yes. Yes, it is. Do you want me to show that now? Um, no, it's okay. I mean, okay. Yeah, you, you know, I'm, I'm afraid if we start screwing around, I'll never get back on again. So I, <laughs> I'm good, feeling good. pretty proud of myself right now. So all, just, all right. I, I get that. Thank you. Um, and then this is my current project. I've got a, I bought from a customer, another one. Um, it's a 55 uh, BN1 that, um, well, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of another car that, that Mark Baker did, the 100R that, that Rick wanted me to talk about a little bit. So I used some cues from that 100R um, and some pieces that Mark, Mark had made and had some leftovers. I'm doing this to a Le Mans spec. Um, it, it, it car is it car is set right now. We just knocked we just knocked this paint down, um, and we set it up for it's going to be black over black over red. We just set it up to get painted. Uh, we pinstriped it this week, and it's going back in the trailer to to go to our paint guy to to have the whole you know both sides redone and re cleared. Um, you know, follow along on this one. It'll be it'll be a nice car. It's going to be fun. Um, you know, it's got a 100 M spec motor, um, you know, alum the aluminum head with a 100 S cam, nothing, nothing crazy, no, no high compression. Uh, but it, it, I think it's going to be a really nice car. And then I got to figure out how you drive two Heelys at one time. So, um, you know, but again, the car came to me, we had the car in the back, we we've done all the work on it. So it was worth keeping. Um, do you want, John, do you want to talk about the 100 R now? Well, I'll just show you a few of the other a few of the other weirdos in my collection here, if you call okay, it. Okay, go ahead. Um, let's see here. Oh no, that's that was wrong. Oh, stop it. Um, <laughs> here we go. Oh, I did it. Hold on. Um, hey, John, you're looking for that. What percentage of your business is Healy's compared to other marks? Oh gosh. Um, Probably twenty percent, twenty five percent. I'd like to, you know, it, 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 we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the, you know, the shop and how it's how I'm operating it. But yeah, it's it's going down. I mean, it's not as it's not as significant as it once was. Mm. Um, let's see here. Did I goofed that up. I could have. I could have. Um, oh, here we go. So some of the other cars that I that I waste my money on, um, I've got a '69 GTV race car. That's one of the other my other uh, vintage race cars. Um, always always a crowd pleaser <laughs> and a huge waste of money. Uh, I've got a '71. I've got I, I, apparently I like Alphas too. I've got a '71 Alpha Romeo uh, Spider. Um, that's the first year of the cam tail. Um, it's not a duetto, but it's a 70, it's a 1750 cam tail. Um, another car I, I reclaimed from a customer that it, it, long story. Anyway, I bought it from his widow, unfortunately, and probably overpaid for it. Cause I felt bad, but it's, it's, it's another, it's another car that I really like driving. They were, they were really nice. Um, did you add those, uh, glass uh, headlight covers? I did. I did. They, you know, they came. They came with the with the option for them in the states. There's some tabs that. on the inside, um, in the fenders, and all you have to do is really add the parts and pieces to it. Um, but they fit like crap, and it's it's a big job to to put them in. So I backed, I, <clears throat> of course, I I uh, backed my street car into the front of that car, 
and hosed up the front end. So while I was go <laughs> while I was fixing it, I just put a whole new. We ended up putting a whole new um, nose on it. You know, the front valance. We we put a whole new front valance on it, lower valance because those things get beat up pretty badly in, on those cars, obviously, because they're just hanging out there. So while we were doing it, I decided to, you know, put the covers on and we were able to match the body style and lines, you know, with the clear covers. Normally they don't fit that well. How about the wheels? Are those stock? Are those different too? Those are GT, those are GTA wheels. They, they're um, an Alfa Romeo design, but they were put on the GTA race cars. And it, I, I just like them. I thought they were being, it was a nice solution for that car. Um, you can buy those through Alpha Holics in, uh, in the UK. You know, I, again, another car, I, I, I had rebuilt the engine to, and the car. Um, we had done everything to the car. I put it, I put a, a limited slip rear end in it. You know, the suspension was all new. It's, it's got a pretty good story to it. Um, and it's got, it's got way more money in it than it'll ever be worth, but it's like every every Healy story starts with that. So um, Healy's Alfa Romeo's, it's the same stuff, you know. Um, I last year I I I purchased from from a a friend's widow again. Um, this is a '65 Alfa Romeo Giulia or Giulia Veloce. It's a real car. They only made about 1,100 of them. This is, I think, number like number 871. And the guy drove it into a ditch, as you can see. And the, the frame's a little tweaked, but I got a really good price on it. And these things will trade upwards of a hundred thousand bucks because there's so few of them. So I've had it to the body shop, and we've had the frame re, you know, re, straightened. Um, but other projects have kind of gotten in the way. But this is this is this is one that you know, this one I'll probably keep for a long time as I'm selling them out and retiring and figuring out which car you want to have around. This will be it. I'll do this one in its original color, which was gray with a red interior. And it's really a handsome car that way. Um, that's how the uh, you know the the, the uh, uh, origin certificate shows. I've also got a Caterham because I'm I'm stupid. I don't know why I even have that car. It's it <laughs> it's it's the tiniest car in the world. You have to have, actually choose what shoes you wear in it because the big you know you can't wear big shoes in it. You got to wear smaller shoes. But it's a blast on the track. To drive it around on the street is, is a ton of fun. Um, you know, I traded one of the rate one of my race cars for this car, um, the one I was working on with Mark, and it's it's just a fun car. Um, but I don't once again I don't use it half as much as I probably should. It's what's up, the farthest What's the farthest distance you've ever driven in that? About sixty miles, and after that, <laughs> I, I hated myself. It was like, oh my god, this is stupid. I, <laughs> I don't know, you know, and, and if you put the top on, you have to go to like submarine training so you don't have like claustrophobia. It's really <laughs> small and you got to crawl in through the hatch and uh, it's, it's amazing. And people just love these things in the UK. They drive the crap out of them, you know, it, but I, you know, I, I find it interesting, but it wouldn't, if I had to sell one, unfortunately, that would probably go first. And I, I, I'm all COVID, I'm like COVID big right now. I don't even know if I'd fit in that thing. I'm, I'm afraid to even try. I have, I put it away. I'm like, okay. Um, when I do need a long drive, this is the car I use. Uh, I, I, I bought this car um, some years ago. It's It, it had 39,000 miles on it. It's a 1983 Mercedes-Benz SEC. Um, I've put about 30, 30 to 35 miles on it. I bought it, I want to say about 10, 12 years, 10 years ago maybe. And I was, it was my daily driver for the longest time. Um, I drove it down to Amelia Island a couple of years ago. I, I just got in the car. I didn't do anything to it. I just got in the car, started it up, drove down and drove back. It never, it never hiccuped. It was, it's really a good car. I like to have it around it. People say, you know, oh, you take your Healy to, you know, Road America or up to Minneapolis. I'm like, no, I'm going to take that. I turn on air conditioning and, you know, have a nice drive. Um, and it shows well. It, it's actually won a couple of shows as an original car. Um, let's see here. This is the five hundred dollar MGA I bought a few years ago. It, it looks. Everybody says, "Oh, just put some gas in it and drive it." <laughs> you get underneath it. It's it's pretty it's pretty bad. The good news is, you know, it's got wooden floors in it. So we just and, and it, it smelled like horse pee. You know, and it's, there was horse. It was just, it was, it was despicable. So anyway, we got it. We've got to take it all apart. We've got the chassis, the frame, 
the chassis um, has been rebuilt. We've got all new metal for it, but it's, I, I ended up with that 104 right in the middle of this project. So once again, choose your, pick your poison, which one do you want to do? So we kind of mothballed this for a while. If it gets slow this winter, I'll bring it out and start working on it. But it, this is, this is another one. that's it's a complete car. It's in really, it was in pretty good condition, except for that we can do that work. So, you know, at the moment, this one will be done in black with red interior as the uh, heritage certificate showed it. It was, it, it'll be pretty. Um, or I'll sell it, but now I'm in, now I'm into it. So you got to kind of keep them until they're not projects anymore. Um, where am I here? There we go. Um, and even, you know, this is my everyday drive, my daily driver without, without my truck is a, is a 2003 five series BMW. So I'm, I'm getting vintage every to every place I go. Um, they, I just restored the headlights on that one. They were all kind of they were kind of funky. Um, so anyway, that's that's my my little quote unquote collection. Um, I think uh, I saw John Heffron, you know, t smoking a cigar out there. I met I met John and uh, John and uh, Ray out in um, Arizona some years ago. I, I had purchased Sport and Specialty, and um, on behalf of the Baker family, um, I took the 100R, which was Mark's car, out to um, out to Arizona to, to be sold at Bonhams. And the 100R was, was I don't know if, it's, you know, pe people have seen it, you either like it or you don't like it. Um, it it's just, you know, it's a standard 100R. This car actually belonged to Mark Baker in high school. And Mark Baker is the gentleman who I bought Sport and Specialty from. <laughs> it was actually his car in high school. And he ended up selling it before he went to college. And, you know, the story, the story goes, he was driving along the Chicago Skyway and he saw this Healy getting pulled by a, a Camaro. And he's like, Jesus, what the hell is that? And he looked and it was his old car, this car. So he asked the guy, he says, do you want to, hey, what, what's with the car? He goes, I don't know. It was, it was my grandfather's on, or somebody's car, or some relative. And, he, and he's trying to get it. He had to, he had to get, move it from where it was in some barn. And Mark says, can I buy it from you? So he bought it. And he brought it home and it was in shambles for a long time. And then over, over time, he kind of figured out ways that he wanted to do it. So his, his premise for building this car was, you know, it's got, it's got, um, Go wing 300 paint on it. That's the color. It was never, obviously, it never an original Healy color. Um, he wanted to make a rally car. If, if uh, Donald Healy had built, you know, not an M or an S, but an R. And so this was a, um, let's call it a mid 50s rally style car. So he's got the, you know, the Jaguar wheels on it. The, the engine, the engine was its, was its kind of biggest flaw. Um, a, lot, a, a few of the things I'm doing with mine, one of the things was to not overbuild the engine. He had a, a hundred, he was, he was pushing about 230 horsepower out of this motor on the dyno. And the, the problem was it couldn't keep head gaskets on it. it. They just didn't, there wasn't enough clamping to keep the head gaskets on. And it, back, this is back, what, maybe 15 years ago. Um, I'm not even sure Cometic offered a, 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 um, a gasket for that. So he always had problems with it. You'd have to start it up and run it kind of slow until it warmed up. And it was like a Blackbird. I used to call it the SR-71 because it had to warm up enough so it would seal. Um, once you got it going, the car was, it, it revved like a, a small block Chevy. It was a wonderful car. Um, but, you know, it, 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 once again, it was, it was so unique. He didn't want to drive it much. So um, again, it, it was, it was way cool. Um, do you have any pictures of the interior of that car? I do. I do. I'll show them in a second. Um, here's the, uh, here's the engine. You know, he had this BMW competition. Um, it was, it did say Dennis Welch at one time, I think. And he had that chair machined off and had that put on there. Um, on the grill, he had a, had an R made instead of an S or an M for the hundred. There was a lot of little tiny stuff that, you know, most people didn't see. Hey John, can you can you hit your full screen button on that? So we're we're getting a lot of your other pictures on there. If you hit full screen on that, that might be even better. 
Okay. Let me see what I can do. You mean on, on this on, picture? On the right hand side. You know where, where you get the big. Yeah, you get there. That's better. Okay. Sorry. There, there you go. go. Now you're okay. cooking. Okay. Cool. Um, anyway, <coughs> that's, you know. You know, it's it's again. It wouldn't. It wasn't something you could run or take to a concord, but indeed, it had a lot of lot of lot small arts. You know, small pieces in it. Um, that was that was the that was the the engine. Let me. Um, yeah, he had that conclave in Burlington in two thousand seven. Yeah. Okay. Car is, car is gorgeous. Well, here's yeah. Here's the back, and actually. Here's the back of the car. You can see he did a lot of detail with the, you know, the the, the bracing in the in the trunk, um, 100 S style, you know, 100 S style tank, the, uh, you know, all the all the little parts and pieces that that went into the car to include the hard top. You know, it really it really came together. The car never even had a soft top on it. He just built it with a hard top. Um, so that you know that, that that really made it nice. Now people either liked this or they didn't. Um, you know, there's the interior on the car. I had to take a picture of a picture for this, but um, I, I've seen the original, you know, what's the, uh, what's the color? Um, Persimmon. Yeah, Persimmon's uh, swatch that he used that came off of an original seat. And everybody says, oh, it was never this orange. So there's that, <laughs> there's always an argument about something somewhere. So that was one of the big arguments was that's not a real color. And he goes, well, I've got, you know, I've got a, a piece of leather that shows it, shows it that way. And I was there when he had the stuff done. Um, I think the way he chose the, you know, the gray carpeting with the, with the orange seats and, you know, the, the, the wheel, I mean, it just turned out, it just turned out to be a special looking car. I think, like um, again, said, it's, it's just a totally stunning car, and, that, and the hundred S buckets, and the, it's just, yeah. just, you know, a remarkable hundred. That, yeah, most of it, you know, and people. This he he brought it out to um, where was that on the West Coast? They did that West Coast um, um, enclave or uh, conclave that year. You know, he brought it out there, and and a lot of people. Oh, I don't like that. He's like, I don't care. I do. It doesn't really matter. So it's, it, it's, you know, we, when we sold it, it's it still, it was my, it was my last, let's see here. What did, the, for, what did it sell for at Barnum's? Oh, I'm seeing it down there somewhere. Yeah. I uh, sold 136 for, for the, at, you know, with a premium. So it's probably, except for the, you know, some of the BJ eights that have gone through, um, you know, over time, this is probably the most, you know, most successful hundred car that's, that's gone through, um, in, in, in the U S auction that I know of. If that's not a, that's not a true M or an S. Where is it now, John? I think the car is in the UK. Um, the guy who, the guy I've talked to the guy who bought it. Um, he was a, he was an expat living in the UK. He had a, let's call it an estate. He was a finance guy. Uh, he had an estate in uh, Connecticut. It may be in Connecticut, but I've never heard a word from the guy. Never yeah. heard a word from him. So I have a feeling it's in a collection somewhere kind of sitting. Um, I hope he knows how to start it and warm it up. And I, I talked to him and kind of walked him through that. He wasn't there for the sale. He had a friend who was at the, actually at the auction and did the bidding. So they had done their homework on the car. So, you know, when they, when they finally, when the guy finally bought it, he wasn't even there. You know, I gave, I gave the guy my information after I, after he completed the sale and said, Hey, if you need anything, give me a shout. You know, no one's, no one probably knows the car better than me at this point. Um, it, 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 true story. It went to, we sent it to Russo steel of all places. I didn't know. Um, the year before and it got bid to like 85 grand and I said pull it home just take it home we had a we had a reserve on it and um, I did a little homework and Bonhams came up with a with a nice deal on this and and we sent it out there and I, I basically you know stayed with the car for two or three days you can't just send cars out to auction and hope they do well you really kind of have to babysit them and make sure they're presented properly and if people have questions you know you can answer them for them um, but it was, it's still, it's still, I think a record for a hundred in the U S. Um, anyway, any questions on that car? 
So you said it, it did 200 horsepower at the rear? Yeah, about 230. Uh, he never had it on a, on a chassis dyno. He had it on a, um, it, it had about, it had a like 11 to one, 11 and a half to one compression. And he had a custom, you know, he worked with um, um, uh, the guys in California on, on, on proper cams and he did, you know, the, it had big valves in it. And he did everything that you could possibly do to that car. And, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a good street car when he got done. It wasn't a good car. If, if the car hadn't sold at Bonham's, I probably would have purchased it myself. And the first thing I would have done was built another engine for it. Cause it, it made the car no fun. Cause you know, you just, you just always afraid of it. You know, the head gasket going on it. Uh, John, this is Ted Cryer. Um, hey, Ted. Where'd the hard top come from? Was that custom made? No, he, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. Um, it, 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 it took a lot to make it, I mean, make it fit, but it wasn't custom made. I know he, he had it with the car for a long time. Um, other people have asked, <coughs> it. I mean, it's, it's a nice piece. I, I, I would tell you, it's probably been cut, uh, cut and sliced two or three times to make it fit properly. You know, as, as a lot of these end up having to do, they just don't, they just don't fit well. Yeah. So uh, this John, one, can I, can I butt in there about that hard top? I think it's a it's a UK made hard top. Yeah, uh, we had a we had a club member in Brisbane who uh, who had a hard top similar to that on a hundred. Yeah, but his fitted straight away. He didn't have to modify it, so uh, it might have been a different supply. You know, they're they're all they're all different. I don't. Every time we get a hard top, I just kind of cringe because who knows? You know, the, the bodies sometimes are different. The hard tops are sometimes different. They're not always all that good. Um, <clears throat> And they're expensive to restore because they're, they're usually cracked fairly well. I mean, they just get it. They usually they're sitting in somebody's barn for 15 or 20 years, getting heat cycled daily, you know, and, and they just don't like doing that. Just, just to chime in a little bit. I, I think Peter, you've got a, a, a guest, uh, Al Vieta coming up in the next tech call who does one of his things is doing uh, high top restorations and does a hell of a job. Yep. And that'll be worth, if you've got a hard top or you're thinking about getting a hard top, uh, you want to listen to Al. He, he does, a, a, does a lot of Sprite stuff. He's done big Heelys. He's an MGB guy himself. He's done that. And uh, he really, he, did, he does some perfect work. So, you know, it's, it'll be good to listen to if you're a, a hard well, top. Good, yeah, good, a good donor helps. You yeah. Know? Same old stuff. It's a good, a good donor helps. You know, you start, you, it, you can't, you can't make something out of nothing. You know? No, and a lot of them end up get, like you said, get, end up being cut up in order to fit. You know, people right. have to, they have to chop them in the middle and stretch them out and do all kinds of work just to make them fit. Yeah. Well, he, you have to do that to Healy's too. <laughs> yeah. So well, even the new ones, the, the NICAL and the, uh, the ones that Pete Farmer sell, you know, everyone I've seen that they've, you know, people, not that I've seen them in person, but people that I know that are trying to install them, they've, they've got to do a lot of custom fitting in order to plop those things on. Well, the other thing is you got to, you also have to know that there's, there's like two versions of those two. There's like kind of a, let's call it a lightweight version, you know, mm -hmm. and then a heavier weight version. And um, when you put them on the cars, they tend to shake. I put them on a couple of race cars for customers and, the, you know, we had to go back and resupport the, the rear window. You have to, you know, we've had to put some extra supports in there just to make sure everything doesn't kind of shake and quake out. Um, I mean, it is what it is. Some of them are good and some of them aren't. Um, let's see here. John, so a little you, how did you, go ahead. What, did, what did you do before you started in sport and specialty? I, <laughs> I had a real job. Um, I was a, um, I, I was in sales and marketing most of my career. And in the last, um, let's say the last 10 years, in my, in my 40s, I was uh, a general manager for a, a, a company called Checkpoint Systems. You know, those little white tags that you see in Walgreens stores that make the alarms go off if you try to steal them? Well, we, I, I worked for that company for 15 years. And um, I was there, I was kind of their in-house turnaround guy. So when I had a chance to... Um, um, exactly. <laughs> that was even younger. I was I was but a mere pup then. <laughs> um, no, we uh, we uh, um, no, I, I ran I ran like Asia Pacific and uh, Asia Pacific and the, and the Americas, 
uh, as a general manager. We did yeah. um, high tech printing. We did uh, auto ID. We did a bunch of stuff. So I ended up having to sell that business. And when I sold it, um, I, I, I was like, you know, I, I got a, a fairly good deal on the way out. So I said, OK, you know, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll I was 50 years old. I didn't know what to do with myself. So I took a little time off. I finished college. I, fi I went to DePaul for a while at, at when I was when I turned 30 and I didn't finish. So I, I finished at 50. And I was trying to figure out what to do. And I got a real job. And I, I went to work for a German company that running their U.S. operation here. And uh, I lasted about four months. I, I, just, I just, I'm like, God, I don't like working. I don't like, you know, I just didn't want to work for anybody anymore. I was working for a guy named Hans or something in, in, the, in Germany. And I said, yeah, I can't do this. So and what I had done was after Mark Baker passed away, he started the business in 80, 91. When Mark passed away, he had a heart attack. He was out jogging. Um, when Mark passed away, we, the business stayed open, but I helped the family run it. So I wasn't working at the time. I was kind of goofing around and um, looking. I decided I had to look for a job. So I helped the family run it for a year. Um, I did their billing. I kept an eye on the books. Um, we kept kind of things moving with the staff that was in there. And then I went to work for this company in Germany, you know, and I, I, I came out. I'm like, oh, this is terrible. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So, you know, what do I want to do for the, for my third act here? Cause I'm not, I'm not going back to work at, you know, in, in corporate America again. So I'm like, okay. And one of the thoughts was, well, I could buy sport and specialty. And, and I'm thinking, Holy cow, you know, do I really want to do that? You know, Mark, I mean, not Mark, Mark was successful, but you know, it didn't, he didn't make a lot of money. And, but I thought, Oh, that'd be a good challenge. You know, I, I had the, you know, the, I had the experience to be able to make something happen. So I, you know, I brought it to my wife who said, you know, do alcoholics make good bartenders? Is that a good thing for you to be doing? And, and so I ended up, I ended up buying the business and, um, and, and at the end of 2012, and I, and I haven't looked back. I mean, it's almost, it's two and a half times bigger, almost three times bigger than when I bought it. Um, I've got a, um, I gotta get rid of your screen here. I think Rick. All right, I got another picture of you. I, I need to share. Stand oh, with, you know, stay with me a bit. Am I choking a dog or something? I gotta make sure. It, it's it's one of you, uh, you know, flying a DC three or something. Oh yeah, yeah, know. yeah. No, that was back in my. That was back when I worked for the company in. Uh, it was a cash register company in uh, Nashville, New Hampshire. Um, I'm I'm still friends with, with my. I talked to my boss from there today. Um, you got you got to put that up so I can I can get to the sport and specialty stuff here. All right, hold on. Okay. Get there. Okay. I got to make sure I don't show the uh, the pornography things I have here. You know. It's, well. Well, maybe maybe you know all these old guys. Maybe it'd be a thrill. Who knows? Well, <laughs> who's the guy? Who's the guy? Who, from the New York Times, he got caught jerking off on his. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no, thanks, Oops. John. Oops. That'll be a, that'll be a first on the HBS calls. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. I don't, I don't get on, I don't get on Zoom calls unless everybody raises their hands first. You know? yeah, well, good, good, good thinking there. Yeah, you know? no, I'm here. I'm in. Did you lose me? No, you're still here. I got so much crap on here. I, I really, I apologize for this. I, I you know. Well, I, you don't I, have I, to show I, that. You don't have to show that. I wasn't really, I wasn't really flying the airplane. Nobody would actually let me do that. Okay. That's most people that know me would prefer I not fly airplanes. Um, well, it's, it, it showed, it showed your jet set lifestyle that all of us, yeah. would, we could, uh, you know, yeah. partake in. We wish we could be jet setters and, you know, well, that was that was a that was probably about thirty two at the time. So. You know, like like Heffern have a big cigar that we could. Uh, <laughs> it looks good with this cigar. You know, be smoking and uh, yeah, yeah. you know. Well, I'm going to let you go back. I'll you, you share your own stuff because I can't find the damn thing and I don't want to okay. bore the crap out of anywhere. Hold on. Okay. There we go. So now I got to go back to share screen. All right, you got it. 
You're back. My desktop. Oh, you may share. Reminder. Anyway, um, sport specially. So anyway, I start. I open up. Uh, you know, we got a new logo. We made it fancy and neat and new. And um, you know, it isn't only Healy's. Um, I, I bought it at the end of 2012. There's. I got a crew. I got a good looking crew. I am really proud of my guys. I've got a good looking crew. Um, the guy on the far on the far left of the photo um, is Ken Billimack. He's our manager, and we've got basically um body guys we've got uh, trim guys we've got electrical guys i've got a mechanical guy um and then we've got our plucky intern who's we're teaching how to do things but um and then kathy baker is still with us she's she does my books she's our she's my cfo um but we've got it we've got a nice staff of guys they all get along they hang out together you know after work sometimes and it's very difficult to, to, to build a good team. You know, people ask what I was really good at in my old world. And I was, I was good at building, you know, super teams and I've done it again. And if you can put together a good group of guys in this business, you know, that like working together, uh, that share, that can share responsibilities that you can cross train that aren't 85 years old, you've done a fairly good job. Um, and I, I'm pretty proud of that fact. And I, I like your, guys are, your management skills coming from the business world, help in setting up sports. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if I, you know, I used to go in and turn, that's what I did. I turned around businesses that either were underperforming or weren't working real well. And, and, and I, I was, I was fairly successful at it. So a lot of that is just kind of, you know, streamlining, making sure you've got the right people doing the right jobs and streamlining the operation. You know, we, we, we can turn around some cars fairly quickly, but we keep, you know, we start try to stay with a very high level of quality. Um, I, I won't take in, you know, one of your, one of your guidelines here was, you know, have you ever turned a job down and I to turn them down all the time. I mean, there are just some cars that should never be restored. And, um, so how do you make that decision? What do you, what do you decide? You know, if somebody comes up to you and says, "I want to restore whatever it is." How do you, how do you make that call? What do you, what do you look at? Or, well, first thing I do is I figure out what's the nicest one of these on the planet worth. Okay, and if you if you use the nicest one of these on a planet guide, and and you know that's a re, except you know except for sharing cigars with Heffern and Donovan and some of the boys. That's the reason I go to the auctions too, is to figure out what the current value on a lot of these cars are. You know, I look at the Haggerty guide, I go to the auctions, I see what the cars look like. Um, you know, if you know that the nicest one on the planet is going to sell for eighty-five thousand dollars or one hundred twenty thousand bucks or two hundred fifty thousand, and you look at the car and you go, "Holy cow! This, you know, it's going to take a hundred thousand bucks worth of fabrication to turn this car into a real car." Yeah, it's just not worth it. You know, there's. And there's guys, you know, the guys that keep, they'll just keep, you know, running around trying to find somebody to restore their car. And typically what happens, you know, at least in my world, is they take it to a body shop and a guy says, oh, I'll do this and I'll do it in my, my spare time. You know, there's no way it's going to cost 80,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks or whatever. And usually those either go in the trash at the, at the end of the day or I get them back at some point and have to undo all the crappy work that was done. Do so, you ever get... Uh, clients that say, I, I don't care what it costs. I, you know, this is, I had this in high school. Or I wanted this car in high school. Please restore it. One of the first questions I asked Rick is, do you love this car? You know, you know, that's, that's the first thing I asked. Do you love this car? Cause I, I, I people come in and first thing, and the, you know, I always know the car is going to be terrible when they go, you know, this is really a pretty good car. When, when I go, <laughs> Whenever anybody tells me they've got a good car, I know, I know they really don't know. They're hoping that, you know, it's whistling in the graveyard. And I, uh, when they tell me they've got a pretty good car, I go, okay, may, you know, maybe you do. I don't know. Let's, let's see what happens. But you get the paint off of some of these things and you don't know what you're dealing with until you get the paint off of them and pull some of the car parts off. You know, so what's, what's say, the I'm sorry. People, they tell you I got a car to restore and it might be, this is the actual car I drove in high school and my, I had my first prom date in it. Or alternatively, I always wanted one of these in high school and uh, I found one and I think this would be a great one to restore. How do, how do you uh, talk to these people and decide, first of all, how much 
it's going to take to restore and 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 whether it's worth it and how much they want to spend well i think the first thing i do is i i have like a little venn diagram that i use you know first thing i ask is do you love this car okay you know number two how long have you had it i mean you, you just buy it you know number three i ask when was the last time you drove one of these i mean there's there's people out there that you know, they think, oh, geez, they look at us in our cars and they go, oh, my God, I want to do that. That's great. And they, you put them in it. And they go, Jesus, this is hot as the hubs of hell. And this is a terrible car. And it's noisy. And, you know, it bounces down the road. And, and, and if they say, oh, no, I love it. I go, OK, has your wife driven in one? Okay. <laughs> and really, I mean, there's a lot of the wives, they don't want to get in it. They get in and go, I get out of here. I smell like gasoline. I smell like fumes, <laughs> I, you know. It's really hot in here, you know, and, and I, I've got other customers whose wives think this is great because, you know, they and their husband are hanging out together. God love them all. I, but you're right. That's exactly the kind of the path I take down. And once you work on that, you know, you've got to you've got to let them know, you know, people send me pictures. And I say pictures don't help. They really don't. You got to put the car in the air, uh, especially on Healy's for crying out loud. And, and you know, the minute. <laughs> The minute you see the, you know, the, the uh, pickup truck bed undercoating on the, underneath the car, you know, you got problems, you know, and there's a lot of ways to hide things on Healy's. There's old work that's been terrible. You know, you, you, you take the car apart and you find out that the chassis, you know, the left front chassis leg is four inches, you know, three inches higher than the other one, but you really couldn't see it because until you got some of the, you know, the inner, inner fenders off and you looked at the work that somebody else did to try to make it fit. I can't fix that. I mean, I can fix anything. I fixed Chuck and Edie's car after they drove it into the back of that Honda at, at Conclave that year. You know, it's fine. I had to put a whole yeah. new corner on the car, though. You're, you're and, talking about Chuck and Edie Anderson, by the way. Right. Uh, uh, right. Long time president and sec yeah. secretary treasurer. Uh, Forever. Years yeah. Years, the Austin Healy Club of America. They, ran, they started the club for all intents and purposes. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, they were where they wanted to send it, you know, but they, it got done right. But, you know, Chuck, who was an insurance guy, didn't have the car insured for quite as much as it ended up costing. Because if you do the car right now, now the car is good. It's a solid car. They can sell it. But if, if somebody took a hard look at that car and all you did was try to, you know, unbend the frame, that's a problem. You know, here's well, John, another. John, you should have been with our, our meeting that last month where we talked about insurance and, uh, a lot of people get an eye opener of how to insure their car and what it was worth and what would happen if they were driving outside the limits of their coverage. It's, it's, it's a big problem. And I, I try to tell people, you know, all the time, I said, you know, what do you got this thing insured for? Or where do you insure it? Oh, I got my, my state farm age, my state farm. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, what is this car worth? It's worth 65,000 bucks. I said, you got to insure it for 90. How come? Because if you crash this car, it's going to cost you all of that plus more to turn it back into a real car because no one's going to insure it. And, and most people don't know that in a lot of states, the insurance company can buy it back from you if, it's, if, you, if, if, the, if the cost to repair it is more than 50% of the book value. I mean, you're going to lose your car and you won't have a choice. You know, you need to – people – they have no idea what the, what's going on with these things. And they've had car, they've had these really nice cars, cars they've loved. Those are the cars that they've had for a long time. And, and they'll lose the car. They'll lose the car. So So John, I, did you have, did you ever do a restoration on a car that was just a complete piece of crap? But a, the sentimental value to the, 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 the owner was so much that they said, I don't care what it takes, sure. just please restore it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's fine. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't open up my check, you know, my pocketbook or my billing any anymore. I mean, you know, I, I have to prove that I'm not, I'm still going to be an honest guy, but indeed, you know, sometimes it's just going to cost more dough than the car's worth. I'm okay with it. I mean, we all do it, you know, Tell we all do it, but that's kind of what happens. Talk about the process. Of, if, if someone comes to you and says, I want to, I've got a, Whatever it is, you know, Jag, Alpha, Healy, I want to restore it. What, what, what do you go through in order to, what's the whole deal? And from the time that that person contacts you until the time it rolls out of your shop, what happens? Oh, wow. Um, 
I didn't tell you this was going to be easy, did I? No, no, no. Well, no, it's actually it is easy. They come in and, and um, you know, we take the car apart. And what we start doing is taking pictures of everything and, and inventorying every part on the car. When do you so give I'll, an estimate? I'm sorry. When do you give an estimate of how much it's going to cost? I, did, I, I, typically, I typically don't ever give estimates. I'll tell you it probably won't cost less than X, Y, or Z. And I'll, and I bill monthly, you know, and I want customers to come out and see what we're doing as we do it. And, you know, as I, as I uncover things, we, we cover the cost and, and, you know, taking it apart and I'll, I'll basically kind of, you know, I, I don't, everybody, you know, if I, if I ended up giving estimates and, and um, living with the numbers that I give people, people want to opt, people, I want to be optimistic. I've done, I've done it where I'm going, you know, oh man, it shouldn't be more than 80 or it shouldn't be more than 40. And all of a sudden you're creeping up on 55 and you keep finding more crap and you keep having to buy new parts and pieces because the ones you tried to use aren't making it, you know, and that's a terrible phone call to make. All of a sudden wives hate you. They hate you. Everybody hates your guts. And I just go, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, we don't, we don't do it. And, and people go, oh, well, you can give me a number. I go, whatever number I'm going to give you, is going to be too low or too high. And if I give you a range, you're going to only pick the number I give you at the bottom. And that's what's going to happen. So I said, you know, I'll tell you, it's probably not going to be less than 80,000 bucks or a hundred thousand bucks. Anybody that says any shop, people can do, you know, people argue all the time. I could do this car for less than 80,000 bucks. Well, God love you. I don't know how much you pay yourself, but you know, you, it's really hard to do a Healy properly for less than 80 grand anymore. And, and the problem is the cars that come in are worse and worse all the time. There's no good. There's, there's very few nice Heelys out there anymore that haven't either haven't been restored. Or, you know, the ones that need restoration now have been around for a while. And I, you know, I'm, everybody, you know, people will argue with me and I'm like, I just live in, uh, that's the world I live in. You know, we're not, I don't try to cobble together cars and call them restored. Most of the, most of the cars that we do are properly restored and safe you know, we don't go, oh, I think we can make do with this part. You know, it, it's not. You so know, who, do you, who do you find as your average customer that comes in and says, please restore my Healy or a Healy? Oh, it's all over the board. I mean, I've got two, I got 104 in now. Um, it's a gentleman that lives in Oklahoma, of all things. He couldn't find anybody nearby to do it. But, you know, he's, he's a collector. He's got three or four. No, he's got five or six other cars. He doesn't have any other Heelys. He's got some MGs. Um, I've got another car that we're doing for a guy who's got some other Heelys. We just fin We just sent another car home um, two or three two or three months ago by a guy who had an, a TR3 and bought this Heely and thought it was a great car until he put it up on a lift and then he went to go and have it restored. And there's a perfect example. I looked at the car and he says, "Well, my wife and I are going to come up and take a look at it." I said, "Okay." We look, we looked at it. I said. Is your, how does your wife feel about this? And he says, what do you mean? I go, I'm going to tell you, this is going to be more expensive than you, whatever you're telling her. You know, and, <laughs> well, that and, happened to all of us. <laughs> well, I mean, well, same old stuff. And he could, I, at that point, I'd be happy to stop. I don't, I don't want to argue. And guess what? His wife was, every time I'd send an invoice, every month I'd send an invoice, if his wife was on the phone, you know, it's like, oh my God, Linda's on the phone again. Here are we, <laughs> you know. When does it stop? When does it stop? I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. And the, the biggest part, you know, uh, Peter, you know, I mean, the biggest, the biggest part is getting the car straight. Everybody says, you know, there's no color on the car. I'm looking at David's, you know, David's car there. There's no color on the car. I said, painting the car takes like five hours. It's nothing. It's making it so you can actually put a coat of paint on it. That'll stay on for the next 15 or 20 years. Nobody you have to explain. I try to explain that to them, Rick, as I go along. So then, you know, what we do is we open, I have a, I have a box account or a photo account, you know, and as we, as we go along taking pieces and taking parts and pieces off the car, we photograph it as we restore them, we put them back on, you know, and, and we, we kind of, we do a, um, a, 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 photo, a photographic history of the car build and we put it online and people can go in and take a look at it as we move along. I bill every month. I, I, I love everybody to come out and see the progress on the car every month if I could. Cause then, you know, then they don't, I've got guys that I, you know, I, I send bills every month. They pay it for five months and all of a sudden they wake up and go, do you know how much money I'm sending you? I go, frankly, I don't. 
I, I bill at the end of the month and it goes out. I don't keep track of each customer. I said, why don't you come and see your car and see how, how it's coming along and see what we've done and see where we've gone from. So, Have you had anybody that, that just taps out in the middle of the restoration? No. Um, I, I, well, I, you know, a couple, I've, I've, you know, either bought their cars or, you know, they, but most of them, most of them finish up. I, I, I try to vet people fairly well, Rick, you know, I mean, you, you know, I, I guess you, you have, you can't, you can't, you know, once a guy gets, once a guy gets behind, you got to push that car in the back. You got to cover that car up and push it in the back and start working on other stuff. So you, that's what's, that's what's known in my world as a wall job. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'd call it the penalty box. I got a couple of cars in the penalty box right now. You know, I'm, it's, he's in a penalty box until he gets square with me. You know, it's fine. But that's, that's just the that's just the way the world works. So, you know, I don't, and I, I'm the I'm the bank. I don't take a big deposit up front and work on other people's cash. I'm the bank, and and I want to do it that way. It's it's it makes it easier for me. Um, I bill people at the end of the month. I expect to be paid within 30 days. Um, if they don't, you know, and, and if, they have, if they have a history of paying slow, they go right in the back and I stop working on their car. And I tell people that I go, I don't have a big contract. I don't get, I don't want you to pay me up front. What I want is, you know, I want you to be involved in this thing. I want you to pay me at the end of the month and we're, we're going to be partners in this. And if there's something about me that pisses you off, or there's something about you know you that pisses me off, I want I never want to be more than 30 days away from a financial uh, a financial settlement. What, then, what's the worst car that you ever took to to restore? If as far as the worst car in, in shape, um, Baker Baker did an MGA that was like awful at one time. We um, we did a. Um, we did a, um, um, I'll show you. Let's see. I'm going to duck out for a resupply of the Jamesons, but talk amongst yourself. <laughs> what kind of host is that? Nice. <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things that um, uh, Rick had asked me to do was also cover some of the Heelys we've done. Um, here's a 100M we did that we had Judge, we had judge Gold um, from AHCA. You know the, the the committee the committee judged this one gold. This is our first gold car. Um, and John, it was done. It, you got a concourse gold with that car without bumpers, huh? Oh, uh, he took the bumpers off. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. the owner took the bumpers off. Okay. No, no, no. It was it was <laughs> it was within. Yeah, it was within you know points. It was nine nine hundred seventy eight points. Okay. Was that that was that was in Gettysburg, right, John? It was, John. It was. Um, yeah, and it was it was a really a really hard long day, you know. I Healy, I, I'm, I've judged Healy's, you know, now a couple of years, and um, you know it's it's tough. I mean, 100 M's, you know, it's the which way the carpet goes. You know, we ended up calling um, Roger Moment is God. You know, he's yeah. he's God. It was Roger's got all the Roger's got all the secrets and all the which way this goes and which way that goes, and he's got the rubber and all the other stuff that goes on this and. He won't sell it to a shop. The owner has to call Roger, and it was it was quite a quite a job. But you know, quite honestly, we're pretty proud of it. I mean, and and Dale, you know, uh, Melvin Dale still drives the car. That's mm -hmm. why he made it the way he wanted when it was done. You know, it's only gold once, but if you keep it nice, you know, it remain it retains its uh, its luster. Um, these are some of the Heelys we did. Um, you know, this is, here's my car at a uh, Cars and Coffee. Um, you know, this is a nice car. It's Concord quality, but indeed with the Toyota transmission, you never get anywhere with it. You, you know, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even try to try to show it anywhere, which is fine. I, right. I was fine with that. Um, the, the, the hundred M you needed to be gold because you'll bring the most money at auction with a gold car. Cause there's so many junks out there you know, with bad parts and replacement things. If you, if you have a hundred M and you have a judge gold, you know, that you'll probably get, you know, you'll probably stay in that 200 range with it. Um, the, um, come on, you can do it. There you go. Here's the car I'm working on now that BN one, 
you know, it's got the, again, it's got, you know, a, a hundred M motor. I'm just going to do it Le Mans, you know, with the Le Mans, but I've got the, I've got some of the R points on it. You know, I've got the Jaguar, I got the Jag wheels on it. Um, some of the things that Mark worked on, I'm, I'm putting on the car, you know, I've got, it'll be bumperless, obviously bumper delete with a couple of other parts and pieces, but I'm hoping to have that done. I'm hoping to have this thing done. Um, Around around the beginning of May, I like to take it to a hill climb if we're still going to have it. You know, optimistically. Um, is that a Dennis Welch head on that? It is. Yeah. It, it's. I put it. I put a uh, aluminum backplate on it. Um, you know, it's got aluminum backplate. I bought all new all new parts and pieces for the you know uh, 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 for the intake. You know, 100 m the 100 m exhaust manifold, which is kind of a header. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want. You know, I didn't find anything extraordinarily. You know, different. A, a gentleman by the name of Dave Brown built the motor, um, but it's it. You know, it's going to be nice. It's going to be nice. It'll 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 be just fine for that. I I did do a few things with the suspension. I beefed it up. I put the the Dennis Welch uh, heavy duty sway bars front and rear. I like sway bars. I don't like, you know, increasing the shocks and the um, spring rates. I want it to go down the road nicely. I just want it to be crisp when it turns in. Um, I also put one of those close ratio um, zero center, zero center steering boxes in it. Mm. I needed to give it a try. Let's see. Let's see how it turns out. You know, it might be. It what, might uh, be. what color is it going to be, John? It'll be uh, black over red. And what right. interior? Yeah, with a red interior. Oh, my favorite color com. Yeah, it should it should be pretty. I, I'm whole, I'm you know, we're we're kind of excited to I'm excited to see it done. Here's a, a real a, a very early right hand drive BN one we did for a gentleman in uh, Kansas City. Uh, we just released that. <laughs> um, you got proper yeah. fenders on that too. BN one What's fenders. What's that? It's got proper BN one fenders on it. Yep. That white one. It does. Yeah. 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 It was, it was kind of sitting funny too. We had to, we had to adjust that a little bit, but the guy wanted it bone stock and he got a bone stock. It's not quite Concord. Cause once again, you know, how you get, you just get into all sorts of snaky stuff, especially with the really early cars. But this one, I mean, this one is really nice. It's a South African car. The gentleman was from South Africa as a doctor and, um, <clears throat> You know, he came from South Africa and, and brought his cars with him. He's got one he drives the crap out of, and now he's got this one that he's doing. We, uh, last year, one of the things I realized was, you know, the Healy, <laughs> Healy Club guys, myself included, are getting a little bit older. So I wanted to kind of expand our, expand our reach. So we, I started doing some work on Jaguars, and we started picking some Jaguar work work up and um i got a 32 year old kid that came to me and said this was my dad's car um i want it to be a gold you know a gold uh, restoration so we we did a gold restoration on it and in 2019 this was the jaguar clubs of north america championship uh concord uh e-type now you got a you got a hundred points on that right well it was nine nine ninety seven and some decimal points but we got what happened was we, we, we got a judge the first time and it wasn't quite perfect. And then we, it, with the way it works there, you got to take it out three times and then you use an average of your three score. So what was wrong or what was a problem with the first time we went back and changed. And then the next two times we took it out in Colorado Springs and Houston, um, it, it's, it scored a hundred, both of those times. So what did you have to fix that it wasn't perfect in the first time? Um, there were some call. Uh, <laughs> Same old stuff. There was the, the color wasn't quite right on uh, some of the boxes in the interior. Um, one of the one of the you know of course you know delivering the car to the customer one of the pieces of rubber came off of the top. You know we, we ended up doing a couple of odds and ends to it, but when we got done it was it was it was it actually I didn't I wasn't I wasn't unhappy that it didn't go a hundred points the first time because. The guy that the guy that judged it was really good, pointing out the things that we needed to fix. Once we fixed it, it was down. You know, it was. was what, did did you think that the uh, Jag judges were tougher than the Healy judges, or yeah, about the same? Uh, the Healy judges are way tougher. The um, the Healy judges are. Oh yeah, the Jag, That's surprising. There's a there's 
it, it, I'm a Jag judge too. And you can't go below, you can't go lower than one knee and you can't go in the car. Okay. Right. You can only, you can only judge what you can observe. So when we judge Melvin's car at Gettysburg, I had people crawling around inside it, underneath it, you know, looking for numbers on, you know, inside the trunk. You couldn't, you can't do that on this car. So now I, I would say, I would tell you the car is perfect. You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, um, I, I would, I would, I would tell you that there's a five speed in that car. Then there's a boss box hidden, uh -oh. hidden away. <laughs> no, I mean, but once again, they don't care as long as you have an adjust, you know, as long as it looks stock on the outside. So there's just, something. John, just to, just to, to, to bring this into uh, focus and, and feel free to, to decline, but how much would a uh, restoration like that cost? It's just a little over 200 because it was a very solid car. Most of the cost on a restoration has nothing to do with rebuilding the car. Mechanical stuff is cheap. It's really inexpensive. I could, I can rebuild a Jag engine and have it painted properly for well under fifteen thousand dollars. The problem is the uh, the fabrication work that needs to be done on Heelys and you know when they're junk, they're junk, and it's it's just hour upon hour about fabrication and replacing panels and grinding them in and grinding it out and drilling out rivets and you know the the, the amount of time that that takes and the billable hours is is huge. Most people don't understand that unless you've done them. So where did you, where did you find the 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 uh, crafts people, the workers to do this kind of work? My guys are really good. My you know Brian, who's our fabrication manager, started with Baker. He's been there fourteen years. So I send them to classes. I send them to classes. I buy stuff for them. I mean, my job is to make sure I got work coming in the front door and that they've got the tools and the knowledge to do it. What kind and of classes do you send them to? Um, you know, Eastwood has classes. They bring in really, you know, fairly, fairly um, uh, knowledgeable guys to come in. And Ryan, you know, Ryan went to, um, you know, a technical school for, for metalworking, for steel, metalwork and steel. Work. How, how about McPherson uh, College? You send anybody out there? You know, the problem, I, I like McPherson and, and the problem is most of those guys come out and they don't go into business. What they do is they go to collections and they work in collections you know, maintaining cars and collections. A lot of them, you know, the only guy I know that came out of there that's actually in the business is uh, my friend Adam Hammer up in Northern Michigan. You know, there's some really good guys that come out of it, but not all of them go into the business. And, you know, a lot of them are, <laughs> I don't want to say it, but, you know, too well educated to do the kind of work that we're asking them to do. I pay my guys well. I'm in Northern Illinois. I'm not in that Chicago land thing where I gotta. Everybody's got to make seventy five, eighty, hundred thousand bucks a year to do it. My guys are can raise kids and families and take care of their work on what I pay them, and and they're really good, you know. But uh, one of my the guy that works with Ryan, he's been with me four years now. He worked at a body shop for a while, but now I brought him in, you know, and I give we give him projects. We cross train everybody everybody in the shop can do other work because that's the other thing is you got to save a guy i mean i can i can see that thousand yard stare in some guy's eyes who's been sitting there grunt you know sanding on a heely he's, he's skim coating a heely for two weeks his eyeballs are popping out you know i need i need to let him take a walk you know i he, i have him changing shocks on a jaguar or something for a couple days you know it's here, work on the torsion bars here. Get, get out of the back and take a deep breath. Can, can you share your hourly restoration rate? Oh, sure. 80, $88. And how does that compare to Greater to Chicago? Where, where's that? How does that compare to Greater to Chicago? Oh, God, it's 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 probably 20, 20 bucks cheaper, 25 bucks cheaper. You know, East Coast, West Coast is way, way more expensive than I am. And most of my... Most of my peers, East Coast and West Coast, pay more than that. I've got a fairly low overhead. I'm, I'm out in the country. I don't. I'm in a steel building behind a farm. You know, I don't have a you know fancy shop. I don't have an office. <laughs> we share we share bench space. You know, um, and that's that's by design too. So if I was a if I was a guy with a Healy, yeah, you know, ready ready somewhere not terribly rusted, but a, a, you know you you run of the mill Healy. What would it cost to to bring that back to life? 
probably not less than 80. If you bring it back to life or restore it. Probably it restore it. What's that? Restore. It probably wouldn't, it'd probably be in the 80 to 100 range. And are you finding clients out there that are willing to pay that? Well, sure. I mean, who, I, are, who are they as far as their, you know, their age groups and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Peter, I would say over 55, over 55. Um, you know, mostly over 55. Some guys are, you know, in their 70s. I, I, I've had guys 80 years old call and I'm like, I don't really don't want to do a car for you for God's sakes. I mean, I think I could die in the middle of the restoration. I don't want to. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, I, I mean, I'm not, you know, I've got, I have, I have some scruples, just a couple, but I have some scruples. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get into a situation where, you know, people are, or I've got guys that are telling me, you know, I'm 78, you got to hurry up before I die. I'm like, I don't, you know, I got enough pressure on me. I don't want that too. Um, but, you know, there's, I mean, people are buying, you know, people are spending money. The people are buying cars. You know, where, where, where do you see the, the Healy market going? I kind of see it sitting with kind of where it's at right now. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'd like to tell you, I can't see it going any lower, but who knows? Um, it's, it's, as far as I can see, it's dropping. Well, I, I would tell you this. I would tell you that the nice cars are always going to bring good money. You know, I, 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 I tell you that, you know, if you've got a subpar car, you, you're not going to get good money. People are looking harder at the cars than they used to look at, you know, they used to be, there was, you couldn't, you couldn't throw money at people enough, you know, 15 years ago or 10, 15 years ago to buy their Heelys. Now there's a lot of Heelys in the market. And I would tell you the good ones, people are paying good, decent money for, you know, and the crappy ones when they get underneath them and they find all the, you know, the mistakes. We just, we just had a car come in. I don't know. A guy bought it. I didn't bring a trailer. I felt sorry for the guy. I mean, he got taken. It is what it is, but you know, the, it was resale red. It was, it was an awful car. It was just an awful car. I didn't know what to tell him. I don't have a, you, sorry, you bought an awful car rate. You know, our restoration rates, 85, our, our uh, mechanical rate or our re repair rates, 95, you know, Ferrari. Sean, Ferrari Sean, I, I, I've got someone that requested a, a picture of your shop. Do you have one of those you can bring up? Um, I don't know. Let's see what I, got. I think you do somewhere. I might. Um, you can go on. You can go on the website. Um, <laughs> yeah, but we're lazy. We're old and lazy. We can't figure out how to do that. No, I know. I know. <laughs> um, you know. I, so, John, I, as you're looking for that, does it make a difference in the cost between hundreds, roadsters, and convertibles? No, nothing. Nothing. It's how you much? know, it's all it's all condition. You know, it's all condition. It's all you know. What kind of condition? You know. <laughs> what what kind of condition is it in when it comes in peter you know and, and the same thing an mgb or a sprite if it's a piece of crap it's still going to cost you the same amount of money if it's a healy yep. you know jag i i the minute i break out the torches the minute we you know we start cutting you know we've got we've got stuff that has to you know has to come apart so have you done any any sprite restorations not really i mean i We've done a couple. We've done a couple of special sprites. They were way expensive, and it was for somebody, you know, somebody that wanted one just that way. Um, and that was back, you know, God, that's some years ago now. But not really. I've got an MG midget in the car in the house right now, right hand drive midget. And the guy showed up with his wife and said, "We want you to." He looked at my shop. People come in and look at my shop, and they go all Hollywood. They're like, "Oh my God, look at this! This is beautiful. You've got beautiful cars in here. I want mine to look just like this." And I, the guys are in an MG Midget, and I'm going, well, "You know, it's a seventy. It's a. I think it's a seventy seventy one UK right hand UK spec right hand drive car." And he and his wife, um, they work for um, Zurich Insurance, right? And they were he was posted there for like eight or nine years. And they bought this car and they drove all over Europe and they have great memories of this car. And somewhere in the UK, he had it quote unquote restored and the rust is popping through all over it. Right. So he's like, okay, can you take a look at it? Sure. We looked at it, you know, so the, the, the biggest job we have right now is, you know, cost mitigation. Okay. You know, it's like, don't touch the interior. So we went through today. I, I went through the job yesterday with the guys and I said, here, 
mask the crap out of everything because I don't want, you know, no, when you blow a car apart, you paint it, you put it all back together, it's easy. When you, when you try to mitigate that stuff, it really makes it hard. You know, it really makes it hard. You gotta, you want to keep the interior. You want to keep this. You want to keep that. You don't want to take anything out. Right, so, what's that? That's, you know, that's the big challenge is to try to try to get the paint off the car and see where you got to go without taking the whole car apart. And, you know, that's like the cheapest way you can do it. And I, I don't really like doing those that much because whatever you, you can fix some of this stuff and some of this stuff you can't, you know, and then you find, you know, you find the guy's got a bent chassis leg or some damn thing and you're going, holy cow, now what, you know? So I, I, I don't like making those calls. I really don't. I, I like to, you know, I like to keep the work straight up. You know, we're going to do a nice job. This is what it's going to cost. You know, I, I, I bill, you pay me, come in, let's, let's be partners on this. Well, John, I, I, I think we've given people a really good idea what it takes to restore Healy, but I think it's probably time that if, if anybody has any questions that they want to uh, fire at John, fire away. What's the most valuable Healy in a, let's say a, a just short of concourse value, you know, an, an excellent, an excellent, but not concourse, most valuable Healy. Well, you know, if you start from, if you take the S's and M's out, you know, the real ones, um, you know, I'd say the tricarbs are still bringing some money, you know, the tricarb, the tricarb two seaters. Um, I think they're still bringing some money. The hundred fours are still, are still, you know, uh, bringing some dough. Um, it, you know, everybody says, Oh, it's a Le Mans car. Well, to me, it doesn't really matter that much. It's, you know, a thousand, a couple thousand bucks, and you can make a hundred of a Le Mans car. It's not going to really bring a lot of money. People are really, it bothers them. You know, I sat in a concession, I sat in a meeting, but it's a Le Mans spec. It was done in 1962. It doesn't matter. It's still just, a, it's still just some pieces you tacked on the car. It's not a real car. So, you know, the BJ eights are always going to bring money. You know, a good, a good solid BJ eight is probably you know, a, a good, uh, you know, a good investment at the moment or a good place to is that get a, a $200,000 car and, and no. number two edition. No. What's that? What, what's it worth? What's it worth? Uh, just short of concourse. A BJ eight. Yeah. Oh, boy. Just short of concourse, probably around 80. Oh, okay. So yeah. spending 80 on it's not such a hot deal. Well, again, do you like the car? Do you want the car? I mean, what are you going to do? You can't, I've had this conversation with, with people all the time. And it's like, look, if you don't want to spend the money, go buy the nicest one you can get your hands on. I'm okay with that. I tell people to do that all the time. I tell people, I send people away from my shop and go, don't spend the money to restore this car. Go out and buy the nicest car you can. You're going to be in better shape, but I really like this car. Okay. I'm fine with that. As long as you understand that you're probably going to be upside down on the car. And the, the problem, the problem you run into, and I, and I tell people, I go, look, you're going to have a brand new Austin Healy. And you say, you know, it's just short of Concord. Well, there isn't really a, a thing that's like short of Concord. That means there's always going to be compromises. And you don't know what the next, next piece is going to go on the car. Unless you have it, you know, you can have the car run up and down sideways. You know, I'm just saying a really, really nice car should sell about, you know, 70, 70 to 80 grand for a B, nice, nice BGA. But if I restore a car and I deliver it to you, it's going to be like a brand new car. So people come in all the time and say, you know, you know, I don't understand why I would, you know, I'm like, no, don't do it. But, or, or we have the conversation and I say, listen, here's the deal. You're going to have a brand new car. You can't drive anything for nothing. That's the, that's the problem. People think, oh, I'm going to invest in a British car and I'm going to drive it for nothing because when I'm done with it, I'll sell it for more than it was worth. No, it just doesn't work that way. It never works that way. People go out and buy BMW Z4s, you know, and they spend 50000 $50, bucks on a Z4, okay? And I go, well, how much is that car worth, you know, five years from now? Well, twenty five, And that's okay. <laughs> nobody probably has, nobody seems to have a problem with that. So I said, you can't drive something for nothing. It still costs you money. So what do you want to do? The best bargain today is to find a used BJ8 in really good condition. And know that what, no matter how good a condition it's going to be, you're probably going to have probably spend another five to 10 grand making sure it's sound because they all need something. 
they all need something. I'm not being negative. I'm just saying, you know, every people bring cars in all the time and go, this car's, you know, this car's great. Oh, you know, you look in and the shocks are leaking and, you know, the, the rear pinion seals leaking, or there's a problem with this. So the clutch doesn't pick up properly. You know, they go, yeah, there's a few things. Well, you know, a few things add up. John, if you were looking for a Healy to buy, where would you look? Where would I look? Yeah. You know, I'd probably look at the, you know, look at, still I'd look at Healy Mark right away because that's a, a, an easy place to look, you know, look on the club online. Um, you can go on, you know, classiccars.com. You know, the biggest, the biggest thing just like buying any used vehicle is finding out where the car has been served and who's been taking care of it. You know, if you can go on classiccars.com, if you can go to Hemmings, you know, any of that, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say bring a trailer only because, you know, I've seen some, I, I've, I've had some cars in that have been bought on bring a trailer that were complete crap. And it, it was scary. I, I felt bad for the customer because by, people are buying cars sight unseen. You know, you should see the car get under the car. I would never, I would never buy a car that you couldn't see, touch, feel, and get underneath. It just wouldn't happen. Yeah, I think that's great advice. You you see your stuff on that, and uh, there, people take pictures that are very complimentary. It's like taking a picture of you know, my best side, which I don't have any, but you know, it's the same deal. They 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 don't take a picture of, of you know somebody's body or you know they limp or whatever they they take nice pictures you know what it sounds to me to bring a trailer is that there are people that are so willing to uh spend that kind of money and never see the car and they don't have any, anybody go out there to take a look at the yeah, car. a little wine well they want their dream car it's a, it's an emotional purchase you know and that's it, this is all emotional. None of us need these, you know, I mean, we don't, but you know, it, it should be, it should be a, you know, a sound investment or at least a sound way to spend money. And when people go and build, bring a trailer, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm amazed at what they buy. And I'm not saying there's, you know, not everybody's getting cheated, but you know, sometimes if it's too good to be true, it's usually too good to be true. It's a period, you know, but John, you make a, you make a very, important point that restoring a Healy is not a great economic decision. It might be a terrific personal decision, but if the goal is to make a profit after the restoration, that's probably not realistic. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely that's not. Right. I, I have people, people honest, that's me all the honest. time. Yeah, my, my uncle Bill died and left me this Healy. So I want to send it to you to get restored and I'm going to flip it and make some money. <laughs> I just laugh. I go, no, 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 that's not how this works. Let me tell you something. Now, if you do the work, then you put the thousand hours into it or whatever, you know, you, you're going to rock and roll. You'll have, you'll, you'll, you know, if you think your time, what you figure out what your time is worth and put the time into it. Peter, you understand that, you know, yeah. I mean, well, it's a, well, that's a very, honest, very honest opinion. I, you know, I think that that's a very important fact. So, so John, what, what's the worst Worst car you started out with that you finally brought back to life? Um, yeah, I'll show you one. <laughs> uh, here. This car came to us, and um, this is a gold car. We haven't had a judge, and we just finished it this year. Everything from the doors down has been replaced. Everything from the doors down. Oh, uh, it must be a North New England car then, because that's yeah, what all the cars uh, are like. It's a mid Midwest car, but we're just <laughs> we're just as salt crazy around here as you guys are out there. And and uh, yeah, it was it was a terrible car. And the guy had done some of his own work and welding and stuff back in the day. The trunk was done. The bottom was done. Um, I've got some alphas that are really really crappy too. And we just well, they, they started rusted on the boat on the way over to the US. Yeah. Didn't they? Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not pretty what you find. And again, you know, I, I, I hesitate to tell people, you know, I bought that 65 I showed you, that red one. I have no idea what's under there. I'm gonna send it to the dipper. 
you know, and hopefully it's going to, it's going to come back in one whole piece, Um, (laughs) you know, but that's, that's the kind of stuff you're seeing, you know, but again, we can bring them back. I mean, there's, there's nothing we can't, I always tell people there's nothing we can't do. You know, you can buy all the pieces. I can buy all the pieces to do a Healy. I can buy all the pieces to do a Jag. We can buy, I can call Kill Martin and get pretty much, I like the Kill Martin chassis, you know, but, or we did a Julie frame for a guy too. They're fine. You know, there's nothing we can't do, but you just got to be willing to spend the money. And if you really want one, you know, and if you really want a nice one, that's kind of where you end up. Um, if, if you don't, it, it's okay too. I mean, they're, they're all, they're all good cars. I, I, I just, I, I just don't like doing. Right, yeah. I, I knew right away, by the way, he was talking. Don't want to, don't want to spend money, you know, don't want to spend money and try to cut corners. That's all. Do we have any more questions from the crowd? Hey, John, what, what, what town is your shop in? We're in uh, a little, it's a town called Durand, but it's actually near Rockton, Illinois. Um, it's just north of Rockford, Illinois. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're we're twenty miles north of Rockford. Uh, like you, I I grew up in Chicago. Oh, okay, okay. We lived we lived in Melrose Park for a while and got out to Westchester and I know our bridge is. Yeah, I um I I commute seventy five miles one way when I go to the shop. Um, it's seventy five miles up and seventy five miles back. I. I um, I've learned I've learned to uh, I spend a lot of th- I, I make all my phone calls since it's hard to ch- talk in the shop anyway in the mornings and the afternoons. But you know everybody says well, why don't you move it closer to home and I'm like well, <laughs> a few things move it closer to home and I'm like well I've got a, my crew is out there, the price is right and then on the other hand you know why don't you move out there I go because to go for a loaf of bread takes 45 minutes. You know? <laughs> like, no, 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 no. So I like the, I like the convenience of my home um, here, you know, so I, I'm, I'm in the shop probably, you know, like three and a half, four, four, four days a week, you know, like today I didn't go up. I had some other projects to do and I had, I went to a, a luncheon with some car guys today. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm the, let's call it the face obviously here, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm the face of the, the, the shop, you know, and uh, so I, I tend to spend a lot of time. If I, I Rick, I've got it, Rich, I've got to, you know, get out. I, there's not a lot of business going on around Durand, Illinois. So I got to come, I got to go to it where it's at. I've never, I've never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, no one has. No one has. I, uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a brother in Lamont and a brother in uh, East Aurora. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm due north of them uh, where I live. I'm near Schaumburg, Illinois. I know where. Any, they- other, any other uh, questions for uh, John? It sounds like that's what the corporate RV is for. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> just parking next to the garage when you don't want to drive back and forth. I hate to say it. That's, that was one of my thoughts, but <laughs> I think my wife would have another op, You know, my, another thought about that. I, there's a there's like an RV park around the corner. I thought about that too. I'm like, oh, this is great, but. I'd have, I could have all my hillbilly friends at the RV park hanging out, you know, I'm like, yeah, I think that's a bad, that would be a bad road to go down. But you got a great logo for the side. Yeah, I know. Right. (laughs) I I only put it on the back of my trailer. So nobody sees it on the side when I park it at the, when I park it for the winter, I don't want anybody breaking into it. Hey, Heffern, you're you're sitting out there in Scottsdale, wherever the hell you are. You must have a good, uh, nasty comment to make for John. Nah, you know, uh, I I I guess my only point is if you pick the right car, like some of these E-types were in 100M, and you spend that 150 or 200,000, you still can be above water (laughs) for a number one car. And, uh, you know, but if it's just a regular, you know, run-of-the-mill Healy, it, it's, you know, a, a, a number one BJ8, 85, 90 on a good day, maybe $100,000. But yeah. if you drive it, it's going to be back down below, you know, at 80 at, at tops. So, you know, it's if you love them, the money's not that important. Here, Here's a car that was hit in the rear and pushed into a telephone pole, Okay. And it was pushed into a telephone pole. And uh, the owner, the owner's in the car, obviously driving the car and loving it. So 
before it was the car was in the shop before Mark passed away. And uh, the, the plan was they were gonna, we were going to rebody. He was going to find another body for the car. Okay. So the body came in, they sent it to the dip stripper. It came back and it, it was awful looking. Right. So the owner comes out to see the car, see his, his new body for the car. And the other car looked like a, a fortune cookie. Okay. It was pushed in on the side that you're looking at here. And it was, the back was crunched up almost to the window. You couldn't do anything with it. So, but the problem was too, that the new body, the new car that was in New York uh, was a right-hand drive car originally came from France. Okay. So, you know, the, the owner comes in and he comes in and I didn't want to do the car. I, I hadn't bought the shop. At, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't, you know, purchased the shop at that time. So I said, you know, he says, he goes, uh, he goes, listen, he goes, and, and this is a God's truth. You know, everybody was standing there. He goes, what do you, th-? he goes, I, I go, he goes, what do you think? I go, it's going to be really expensive to do. Okay. It looks awful. And he says, uh, he goes, but I really love this car. And I said, listen, he goes, well, what do you think I should do? I said, sell those Barani wheels, sell the V12 and the, and the, you know, the drive line. It's got some real value there. I said, well, we'll sell all the interior parts. I said, you know, they don't make stuff for this thing anymore. I said, we'll sell all those parts. I said, we'll take that money. We'll take your insurance money. We'll fly out to Scottsdale. We'll buy the nicest one we can. We'll drive back laughing our asses off. Let's go do that. He goes, but I really love this car. And I said, <laughs> I go, what do you think? He goes, he goes, well, I don't know. He goes, he goes, what do you think? You know, it's going to cost like 85 or 90. I, I go, keep going, keep going. Well, you know, as it turned out, it was like, we, when we got done, it was like 215 grand to turn that car, this car, that car into this car. That's what it was. You know, we had to, we had to make, we had to fabricate a, a firewall and we had to move all the steering gear from the right side to the left side of the chassis. I mean, all these things. So, but, but, but here's the deal, you know, like, like John just said, in the meantime, 330 Ferrari prices went from like junk. They're all of a sudden they're trading at 325, 350,000 bucks. The guy was saved. I was saved for God's sakes, you know? And, and but, if you, if you pick the right car to spend money on it, it's, it doesn't hurt as much. You know, well, you know, John, John, what you said, I mean, when I was younger, a, a 330 GTC was junk. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's what you bought to do a replica of a uh, Testarossa or, or something else. And no one in one of these cars, they were, right. they were just crap. You know? right. Yeah. This is one of the nicest ones in the country now. <laughs> it's, they're, they're, most of the ones that are still surviving aren't even that nice, you know. But the guy put a ton of money into it, and like I tell you, you you start peeling these apart, they're terrible cars underneath. They were used. They were supposed to survive. You know, you think Heelys are junky sometimes? This thing was, you know, this was this was not a high quality vehicle. You know, okay. Enzo sold some of these. He liked these cars, but he sold some of these just to just to go racing. You know, that was it. But it was, you know, you asked for cars. I mean, here's another one that we did, you know, that, you know, turned out really nice. But it was a custom car. We, we were able to do, st- I love doing this stuff because it's, you know, outside of the normal, you know, grunt and weld and grind stuff. But, you know, we were able to do this and the customer wanted, this is the customer spec. This was fun to do. You know, this was fun to do. Um, there's another one here. This is this is getting delivered probably this week, but it's uh though this guy's so upside down I don't even I don't even know where to start. And I told him, I, said, I told him originally, I said, and he's a he's a good guy. We're friends. And I said, listen, you know, he, he specced out this car and I said, just go buy, you know, a white body, you know, 68 GT must Mustang white body, and we'll start it from scratch. Mm-hmm. No, I want the title, I want it to be a real GT, blah, 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 blah. Well, he did, and we found it. I found a project for him, and we it was it came out at you. It came out from the northeast. There was a guy up in Mass, and they drove it out, and he bought it. Oh my God! And, you know, once again, once we started peeling the onion, it was just worse and worse underneath it. Is that a five hundred? No, it's 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 a GT. It's it, we we a three hundred and fifty. Yeah, it's a it's a yeah sixty eight GT. Um, no, it's just a regular GT. It's not. Oh my a Mustang GT. Right. Yeah, we didn't. Not a Shelby. Right. Right. So I, I will, John. I will, I will share you with you my GT three hundred and fifty story. Uh, 
I was close to a wrecking yard, a junkyard as we called it. And I would hang out there all the time to find something rebuildable in the late 60s, early 70s. And I saw a genuine Shelby, uh, this would be a 67 GT350. And I, I told the, the guy that owned the junkyard that I knew, I said, I'll, I'll take that car. He wanted $500 and been completely stripped. And I said, I'll take it. And I never got the car uh, because it was sold back to the original owners who I found had stripped the car entirely, kept all the parts in their garage or barn, uh, claimed it as a theft, because they dumped it out in the in the swamp somewhere. And after they got insurance money, they went back to the junkyard, uh, bought it back, and put all the parts back in. So I never had a chance in the world. So the only chance I had of having a, a genuine Shelby car uh, was, was uh, stolen away from me by those bastards. <laughs> by thieves to begin with. <laughs> well, yeah, they were, you know, and, and the funny part was that, you know, I, I started talking to my friends about it because, you know, I, I grew up in a small town in southeastern Massachusetts and rumors spread real fast and like, oh, you know why you didn't get that car? I said, no, I don't know why I got it. You know, I, I had the $500. I was ready to pay it. Uh, well, I got to tell you the background story. These guys in Taunton took it and they, they had the car and they ended up. You know, back in the 60s, there were, there were some great stories about, you know, cars that disappeared. Yeah, thank God. Thank, thank, I don't know. I, every time the Secretary of State comes in, I got all my paperwork, you know. People, I have people send <laughs> yeah, me you know, back pictures then, of their titles. None of the cars had VINs. They, they, everything was, you know, you look at old Healy's and you go online and somebody, uh, you know, post something or bring a trailer and you look at the car and you go that that title doesn't match up with that chassis number it's a bunch of crap it's not yeah. what that car is but that's just what was done at the time you know well i have i have a whole drawer full of healy vin numbers or vin plates you know they did yeah. collected them over time because they, they just fell off the car so i don't know it, it seems to be more trouble than it's worth to try to do anything with them Oh, this, this is a nice Aston. Yeah, this is a DB23 that we did some years ago. Um, the car the car is coming up for sale here soon. Uh, the owner's moving. To, he's he's going to retire in Italy. I'm out, he says. Um, but it's it, it's another beautiful car, and the guy drives it all over the place. So, you know, we've, we've, we've done stuff other than Healy's. Um, and we'll continue to, but, you know, we've got, we've got parts for Healy's. We've got, you know... Everybody, everybody keeps talking about, it. oh, we're just going to, I, there's a couple of Facebook um, Healy restoration um, pages every once in a while that I look at. And some of the questions on there are enough to make you jump out of your skin. You go, oh my <laughs> goodness, you know, what do you, what, what, what do people think that, you know, so it, 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 I, you know, my only, my only, um, you know, my only advice for people, that, you know, to want to restore a Healy is, you know, be courageous. You got to be courageous because you could. There's so many of these cars that are half done and quarter done and three quarters done. You know, once you start taking them apart, and the other piece is, you know, people go, "Oh, I just bought a Fender and it doesn't fit." Well, <laughs> welcome to our world. You know, I don't know. I have no idea how these cars were ever assembled in the factory because if you take if you take one of these cars and take it apart and go to put it back together again, nothing fits the way it did when it was on the car. If you, nothing, we're, we're taking little, little trimmy, little pieces of, tri, you know, out of the, out of the door shut face. And, you know, I mean, we're just adjusting everything. It's like, is this the same car? Is this the same fender? Is this the same door? And it is. Mm -hmm. it, if they're like big springs, the minute you, the minute you take them apart, they're like a watch, you know, they just come apart. You can't, you got to put them back together a little bit different. You know, John, I, have, I have a question for you, John. Sure, uh, when we talk about some of the gear that goes to these cars, do you have sources for new old stock parts, or is that a constant problem for you? For new old stock, I no. I mean, I don't. I I I used to keep a lot of parts in our barn, mm -hmm. and I got to tell you, 
Number one, the the the, re, the repo stuff has actually gotten a little bit better, a little bit better over time. It's not quite as crappy as it was. Um, some of the stuff, if you go to Kill Martin, their parts are a little bit better than some of the stuff that's that's stamped in the you know in, in Europe. Um, you know, new old stock is not just as simple as it sounds. You know, there's just there just isn't that much of it anymore. And well, it's interesting. The only reason to bring it up is you you let you live pretty close to a hotbed that a lot of people don't know about. In Madison, Wisconsin, just across the border, there's a place called Worldwide Auto Parts. Uh, a fellow who runs it is Peter. I've been to his shop. Yep. And uh, he has he has a room he calls the Lucas Room. Yep. And there are people around the country. I'm just curious if you if you had resources because trying to replace some of the gear, whether it could be speedometers or whether it could be directionals, it, it's difficult to replace some of these items. You're right. You're right. And we, you know, we, that kind of stuff we tend to hoard. You know, and Peter's a good, you know, he's a good source for a lot of those things. Um, yep. Keeping them, keeping an inventory, keeping that stuff in inventory isn't really a good business decision anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and most of the stuff you can get, even from Moss, is, is okay. But like you said, if you want, if you're looking for something to do a Concord build, you know, I'll, I'd call Peter. You know, yeah. I, I'd, I'd look around for it. Day to day, well, stuff, day, to day uh, stuff, nobody wants to spend that kind of money, though. That's the problem. Peter, Peter was a, a, a guy who grew up in New England and, and moved out there for some strange damn reason. But he does, if you want to do a uh, rebuild of your shock absorbers, yep. he's probably the best guy going. Yeah, we just send him up. He's, you know, I call him. He sends down a set. I send him, a, uh, I send him cores. I mean, we do it all the time with him. I mean, he's, John, he's, John, I have to laugh at, at the Aston because when I was in college, and I don't want to make it sound like I had tons of money to throw around, but I at that time... Uh, this would be 1969, 1970. I stumbled across a Aston Martin DV4 that had a Corvette engine, and for some reason it, it spoke to me because you know you put a big V8 in some British car, and I'm I'm there, and they wanted to sell it to me for eighteen hundred dollars, and I wanted to buy it. And he said, well, that's fine. You could buy it. But I, I've given a friend of mine first refusal and he ended up buying it for the 1800. And I, I, I go back and I look at these cars online and go, oh, good. They're worth 300, 400, 500,000 now. And I go, yeah, but I just wanted a car with a quarter engine. I didn't really care about, you know, so. Uh, yeah. as, I, as I tell people, there was a point where all these were, were old cars. Yeah. You know, and I look at I look at crappy work, and I look at stuff that wasn't done properly, and I look at it and go, "This was just an old car. Nobody gave a crap." You know, I mean, you know, some of the Healy stuff I see today it curls your hair. You know, I'm like, "Oh my goodness, look what somebody did." You know, oh, you're totally right. When when you start looking at and, and if you're been into Healy's or old cars, or old British cars, you know all the crap people are doing because you did it yourself, and you know. You, you see something on bring a trailer and you know right to go where to look at this stuff and go, hey, I saw this picture and I know where you where somebody cheated or somebody, you know, did a the crappy job. So you're right. You I'm sure you see all, all the really terrible stuff. I'm 64. I graduated high school in 1974, you know, right? We all wanted those cars. We wanted everything. We wanted MGBs, we wanted Triumphs, we wanted Healy's. You know, and and if we did get our hands on something, the, the the we bought the cheapest one we could get our hands on, and we restored them with parts from Napa. You know, the minute the minute the minute I look underneath there, and there's like crimp connectors holding everything on, and you know, the minute I see yellow and blue and red, I know I got problems. You know, and that's that's where you know you're just like, ah, oh, geez, here we go. You know, and, and if you see that on a car and somebody goes, oh, this has been, you know, professionally maintained and you see crimp connectors run like hell, just run <laughs> like hell. It's, you know, and that's, and that's how they, those cars were done. And like, you know, it was Globe Auto Parts for me was the junkyard that we went to for, oh, you, you got another one of those starters. You got another one of those generators, you know, we didn't have them rebuilt. I couldn't afford that. I just threw another used one in. That's what, that's what we all did. But 
those are some of the cars that are coming in today. And you're like, oh my God. Was that Globe Motors in Bridgewater, Mass? No, it's a, <laughs> uh, oh. no, that's one of, this one's on Irving Park Road in Bensonville, Illinois. You know, oh, okay, because there was another famous Globe Motors in Southeastern Mass uh, that was heavy into the British cars, particularly also a race team. Was it well, you know, th I, I want to thank you, Steve, because, I, you know, Steve and I grew up in the same area in, in southeastern Massachusetts, and, and uh, we well remember Globe Motors uh, in East Bridgewater? I think maybe it was East Bridgewater, yes. Yeah, and I, I, I still have some, some old business guys from them, et cetera. It was, it was the place to go south of Boston for all us morons that like British guys. And uh, uh, it, still, it's fun to hear that. We're but, still uh, John, I, uh, you know, you really have, have uh, shared a lot of stuff with us that I, I think we knew, but we wanted to know. Uh, I, I'm going to end up here. Does anyone else have more questions for John? Because please feel free. <sighs> or if you'd like, you know, I might, you know, go, go if you go to my website, you know, sportandspecialty.com, I, I've got all my contact information is there. You know, I'm John at sportandspecialty.com is my email. You know, if you don't, if you don't send me like a five page, please answer all these questions, email. <laughs> I'll actually I'll respond to you or I'd rather talk on the phone because I've got a long time in the car on my way to the shop in the morning. If you got any questions or you're, you know, you're thinking about something or you like an opinion, feel free to give me a call. Just don't call me next week because I'm going to be out in Arizona with Heffron causing trouble. <laughs> um, I, I, All right. Well, thank you, John. I, I really appreciate uh, you participating. As you probably noticed, I, I've been putting the touch on all my, my Healy friends over the years to, uh, you know, spill their guts on this stuff. And next month, we will have uh, Reed Trouble from the Healy Mac that will, you know, if you want to throw brick bats at them, I want to find out what it takes to get your car featured in, in the Healy Mark. Uh, Reed will be here for that. Uh, I really appreciate having all my Healy friends participate. It, it's, it's, it's great to find out the stuff that we all have in common, and it's great during COVID times that we can't meet together. Uh, so, and, you know, I saw Michael Salter, who I'm going to put the touch on in the future. Uh, and I think this will, you know, be the end of the, the call, but uh, just keep on hanging on in there and I'll send this stuff out and, uh, you know, try to keep together as Healy people during the COVID. And this is where we will end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks John. Thanks, Great John. job. Pleasure. <clears throat> Thank you, John. My pleasure. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Uh...